XY Group invites all AEC industry leaders to the 2024 AEC Small Business and Entrepreneurship Forum, the premier event for small firms in the AEC sector. Experience innovative strategies and insights on May 21st, crafted by Zweig Group's industry experts. Engage in keynotes and interactive sessions focused on recruitment, retention, and business growth. Join Zweig Group for this unique networking opportunity and take your business to new heights. Secure your spot today and be part of the AEC industry's future. Visit ZweigGroup.com for more information. The Zweig Group team looks forward to welcoming you. Welcome to the Zweig Letter Podcast, putting architectural, engineering, planning, and environmental consulting advice and guidance in your ear. Zweig Group's team of experts have spent more than three decades elevating the industry by helping AEP and environmental consulting firms thrive. And these podcasts deliver invaluable management, industry, client, marketing, and HR advice directly to you, free of charge. The Zweig Letter Podcasts, elevating the design industry one episode at a time. Hey folks, and welcome to another episode of the Zweig Letter Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Wilburn, and I'm excited to be with you today. I have got a great episode in store. And one of the reasons why uh, I enjoy episodes like the one that we're going to have today is because quite often there's a lot of people that listen to the Zweig Letter Podcast, and we've been one of the longest running podcasts in the design industry space since 2016, which is kind of a cool thing. And From time to time, I'll get an email from somebody saying, hey, I represent so-and-so or I work with so-and-so and and they've heard your podcast and we'd love to be a part of what you guys are doing at the Zweig Letter Podcast. We've been big fans for years and it's always nice to get those emails. And so today's guest is no exception to that rule. I am here with Ross Weimer and Ross is the global head of architecture at AECOM. And uh, Ross was kind enough to join us today for what I think is going to be a really really interesting conversation that you know that he's very passionate about and there this is a conversation that's coming up more and more nowadays especially in the design industry space and when we start talking about renewable energy when we start talking about climate change and just ways that we can do better at protecting our environment design professionals play a major part in that whole process and that whole conversation and so I think you're going to be really interested to hear what we talk about today. And so I'm excited to have Ross Weimer, Global Head of Architecture at AECOM, join us today on the Zweig Letter Podcast. Ross, how are you doing? Great, Randy. It's it's really exciting to be here. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. So listen, we always get started off the same way, Ross. And that's just, and I told you this before when we had our preliminary conversation, I want you to share just a little bit of your superhero origin story, then we're going to get into the meat and potatoes of this whole concept of renewable energy and the things that design professionals can do to protect those most vulnerable communities that are being impacted by climate change on a regular basis. Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, my origin story, I mean, I, I think I've been all over the planet. I'm, I'm an architect. Uh, and when I came out of school, I was very fortunate to have opportunities to do the stuff that you're taught in school. There are a lot of architects out there. They're involved with all different aspects of the process of architecture, but not so much design. So I was really fortunate that I was able to to be design focused really from the time I came out of school. But what that that means today is that means you're on a plane all the time and you're having to learn about new places and learn how your architecture is going to fit in that place, how to make it appropriate to that place. But I think that the benefit of that is that I've had to look at different sorts of environmental situations. And that's what's really prepared, well, prepared me to try to take on these challenges of climate change, because I've been forced to do tall buildings in the Middle East or in China or in unusual unusual conditions. So that's what we're starting to face, even places where we, we had fairly typical weather in the past. Yeah. You know, and it's funny that you say that because I was just reading 
the other day about some of these large buildings that have been built in just in the past decade or so that have that aren't what they appear to be, like the Burj Khalifa and the fact that it it is just now getting its own water wastewater treatment capabilities that it didn't have before that. Something that I didn't understand is that it didn't have actual city plumbing going into the Burj Khalifa, which I thought was really interesting. But, you know, that's just one example. We see the facade, we see the exterior of these wonderful buildings and creations. And sometimes we miss out on some of the other aspects that are impacting our environment overall and how that plays into it. So I think it's just interesting that we're having this conversation right now. Yeah. And I think, well, I think some of the challenges are that the yeah, infrastructure is catching up to the scale of some projects. I'm sure that's true for the Burj. You know, in addition to the Burj, there are large areas of Dubai that are planned for further development and their infrastructure you know, just needs to catch up. They're very eager to, to build a lot of residential to drive, to drive the city. So they're, they're, they were, they're kind of in city building mode and they were moving so fast that I think it took a while for that stuff to catch up. Yeah, yeah, no, and and I just and I mean again, I, I'm certainly not pointing any fingers at the designers of that wonderful building because it's absolutely a, a phenomenal building. I've had I haven't seen it firsthand, but I've had several friends that have experienced it, and they say it's it's one of those things you have to put on your list to do is to visit that. But I just think overall, it speaks to the challenges that designers face in our current environment in the current way that things are in our world, right? And it's like, we have to be so cognizant of the fact that we can't just get a plot of land and build a building or create some type of infrastructure. We have to be very thoughtful in our approach to it, where it requires a lot of thinking beforehand. It it requires, you know, charrette after charrette after charrette to determine that what we're about to design is going to fulfill the needs of whoever is going to utilize those facilities for years to come. And on top of all that, we have to think about the environment. Yeah. And one, and one thing, I mean, since you brought up the Birch and, and wastewater, one of the things that we're doing for some projects depends on the location and the code. We're trying to make these buildings as self-sufficient as possible. So rather than putting out wastewater into the system, we're processing the wastewater internally. So we're able to take gray water and recycle that. It's more expensive and complicated. It takes a lot more space to process black water, but gray water, and, and that typically, you're going to get gr- more gray water out of a residential project than out of, say, an office project. You know, by processing the gray water, we can ba- make the buildings more self-sufficient and have less impact on the community that they're placed in. Yeah. Well, that, and that's, I mean, that's exciting that, you know, obviously, yeah, it's funny you say all of that, Ross, and I don't know if you've ever dealt with this when encouraging some of your younger peers and and those that are coming up under you, but having to remind them that, you know, the work that they do really matters. It really does matter, right? You know, I always have to, I always feel like I've been involved in the design industry space for, and I'm really dating myself now since 97. So that's like 25 plus years. And one of the biggest challenges that I have always seen with a lot of design professionals is the struggle of imposter syndrome. The fact that, you know, their their role is not as important as it really should be esteemed. And I'm constantly encouraging any engineer or architect that will listen to me that what you do matters and that you make the difference in the world. And I, and I tell my kids all the time, because they ask me or they try to have me articulate, you know, the people that I work with. And I'm like, listen, I, I consult and help those that are responsible for the built environment, period, full stop. And what they do is extremely important. And I try to remind design professionals of that on a regular basis. Yeah, no, and and I agree. I think that it's it's, it's a great point because I think part of what you're describing comes from the fact that many people are working in a small practice, right? So it's hard for you to read where your kind of your contribution is making an impact. But I think what you're describing is absolutely correct that, you know, cumulatively, right, you know, when we have better results, when you design a building that uses less energy, you know, that's going to con- that's going to contribute to the larger whole. But sometimes it's hard to see that. And you know, since you know, I'm part of AECOM, which is an enormous company, when we really embrace you know changes, embrace sort of ambitious projects, we can see the scale that we're working at because we have so many offices and so many people. It's a little easier to perceive. 
But I think you're right that if you're in a small practice, it's not as easy to understand. But I think it's true to just just reinforce the fact that it's there and that that everybody's making a difference by trying to push, you know, push the technology further, push sustainability further. Yeah. Well, I was certainly heartened by the email that I got from your colleague, Paula, that reached out and told me about some of the work that you guys are doing around renewable energy and why you're trying to have this discussion early and often, if you will. I'd love for you just to kind of maybe talk about the genesis of how AECOM decided to take up this mantle and run with it. Were there just a lot of internal discussions or was this just something that across the board, you just all realize it, we have to do something about this now as opposed to, and, and not treat it as an afterthought? Well, I, it, part of this comes from the fact that the, our clients are demanding this of us. So what's a little bit unusual about AECOM, so we're a big company, we're publicly traded, and you know we're embracing ESG, right? Because we want to be traded in within uh, ESG portfolios. So it's very f- important for us from the standpoint of the C-suite. But what's different about AECOM is we're a professional services firm, and so we're working with our clients to do all of those things that are embodied in, in ESG. So for instance, you know, when we design a building, we're designing that building to be a high performing building, right? So part of this, this issue, you know, addressing s- sort of renewables, the movement towards renewables, and also, you know, climate changes that we're trying to limit the amount of energy we were using on individual projects and have them create less waste. So we're helping our clients with that right now. And we have been for, for a long time, but I think all of these issues have been moved more to center stage today because, uh, well, for, for a number of different reasons. I mean, partly because people are becoming more aware of climate change and the fact that we need to do something different, but also we're seeing changing building codes that are demanding higher performance from buildings, also starting to demand a measurement of carbon embodied carbon and um, operational carbon in our projects. And in the future, we'll, you know, people will have to provide carbon offsets for buildings that are more wasteful. So we're really working with our clients to try to trim their portfolios and make their buildings more efficient. Yeah. And ESG, just for the layperson, I want to make sure everybody fully understands that. Do you want to articulate what ESG stands for? Well, you know, I, I'm still learning what ESG stands for. But Environmental, social, and and and, Go- and governance, uh, and government, and or governance is is what the acronym is. And these are strange bedfellows too. But I think that the, the goal with each of these is these are all meant to provide just a, a better, be focused on a, a moving forward toward a better world, right? So that what we're mostly focused on is the E, because th- those are things that we can change, and to a certain ex- extent, the S. Because there's a social aspect to our projects that's incredibly important. The governance is a little bit different category outside of what we're really what we're involved with. But I think that terminology is something that's becoming you know quite commonplace for everyone uh, in the design industry because our, our clients uh, are also concerned about their their ESG portfolio. Yeah, absolutely, and for. You know, the average person too, I mean, any company that's out there that's doing business in the world wants to show people, whether potential investors, potential customers, that they are a socially responsible part of the community. And I think that's important for people to understand. And and that's why I think what Ross is doing is so important and why it, it's going to become a much bigger conversation in the design industry space as we continue on. Yeah, and and I th- and also think it it will morph into other things. So this is very early days. I think that there, it, you know, the definition will become more specific, and I think that the the whole industry will start to respond to it in different ways. A little bit like lead, right? When lead first came out, there was a lot of skepticism, but you know now we have developers coming to us, and they're requiring that the buildings are lead certified. When we first started out, you know, I, I think there were challenges because people didn't want to add cost to the work and they didn't really see the benefit of it. So I think for ESG, it's like the early days of, of lead right now. Yeah. Well, and I, and I can remember, I, you know, now, now you see building owners that 
will show you with pride their lead certification. It's like, look right there, we're lead gold or lead platinum. And, you know, that's that's like one of the first things that people lead with. Uh, no pun intended. So, you know, exactly. But, no, but yeah. no, I think you're right. But it's yeah. it's been a process, right, to get to that point. Because early on, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't know if everybody embraced it in the same way, but I think yeah. you're absolutely right. Man. Yeah. So, okay. So now, in that same vein, my question for you is: How do you plan to educate people on what this transition to renewable energy is going to look like, and the impact that it will serve within the communities that we're in? Well, that's the first of all. That's a great question, and it's not always easy. So uh, I'll describe the way, well, we work with our clients to help kind of help them under, understand how they're stepping into this. So what we'll typically do is we'll, we'll do a range of possibilities for a building, let's just say in terms of its, its level of environmental responsibility or sustainability, and we'll attach a certain cost to it. So you could begin kind of at a base level that, that's meeting the code. And then we'll layer on other systems and capabilities that get you to a higher level of sustainability or performance, and we'll attach cost to it. Because I think that you know, the challenge always is that you know, people want to know what they're going to get for their investment and what are the benefits associated with it. So I think there, there's a great way to tell the story where the owner is going to ha- achieve really great benefits and they can understand quite clearly what their investment's going to be, right, to achieve a higher level of performance. Yeah. And I mean, you're, you're getting that in practice with several projects that you're working on through AECOM. But then the other piece that you're doing, and I, and I want to talk about that, I, I do want to come back to that, because one of the biggest aspects of this whole process that you guys are focusing on is your desire to bring along this younger generation of talent help them be mindful about this process, which they probably already are, but it's just giving them the language through which to describe and to articulate this whole new you know, way of, dis- of working with firms uh, from a design perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and in a funny way, <laughs> yeah, a, lot, you know, a lot of our young professionals are coming to us with that in mind. So you know, like you're saying, Randy, you know, it's not necessarily that we have to uh, teach all that much. Because yeah, I think through social media, through the news and so on, there are a lot of you know, young designers who are joining the company who very much want to be engaged in that. And because, you know, so we're, design- we're architects, interior designers and so on, but we're also attached to a company that does engineering. So we're able to create a team that's not just architects. You know, we, we can bring the engineers to the table as well. And there's a really great kind of interdisciplinary coordination that goes on in our projects. And that's something that, that a lot of uh, our young designers are really excited about, right? So it's, they're not getting it secondhand. Oh, we talked to the structural engineer. This is what we're going to do. Structural engineers at the table, mechanical engineers at the table. And then we're able to work more efficiently, but we're also able to kind of do a lot of iteration, just testing of systems, of building shapes, orientation on the site to understand how well the building's been performing, right? So we, we do this digitally, but you can, you can actually take you know, a volume of a building, rotate it, say, 90 degrees on the site, and get an understanding, for instance, of how much heat gain you're going you're gonna to have inside the building just by testing it digitally. So you know, our young professionals are, are already trained up in the software before they arrive, and they're really excited by the possibility of using these techniques and to have an impact on how they work. Yeah. And you guys are kind of taking this to the the nth degree, if you will, because you've said not only is it beneficial for us to really create language around this whole idea of renewable energy within the confines of AECOM and how we work and operate, but you've also backed it up some and said, you know what, we got to get the young people before they even get to AECOM, before they even matriculate through college. And I would love for you just to kind of share a little bit about what AECOM is doing to host studios and work with college students to talk about and tackle sustainability and design issues. Well, I mean, a specific example is I was just down in Houston a few weeks ago, and we sponsor a studio at uh, the Harvard GSD. And this studio focus was really about climate change down in Houston. And so we met 
with students both from Harvard and University of Houston and high school kids. And we helped run a workshop. And it was really exciting to hear from the high school kids what they were doing in their own neighborhoods that was related to you know, aspects of recycling, waste, community gardens. But they're very cool to see that they wanted to be active in their own communities doing things that they knew were going to be better for the climate. And they were very excited about being able to talk about it in this group environment. And you know, the, then the students shared some of their work, the, the Harvard students shared some of their work on the shipping channel in Houston and ideas about how neighborhoods can be made more resilient to protect against sea level rise and so on and these extreme weather events that they experienced. So it was really fun and it was exciting to see, you know, these young people really engaging in the topic. Yeah. I mean, I, I would imagine so, right? Because maybe 15, 20, 25 years ago, that you wouldn't nearly have been thinking about the social impact of a project with the Port of Houston the way you are now. And and also I have found, and I'm, you know, I'm I'm in my early 50s, but I have found that this younger generation sometimes gets a bad report in terms of you know where Gen Z is and with this new generation. Some of my, my youngest child is part of Gen A, right? Which is I forget the age range, but they're young and but they're like beyond digital natives. I mean, they're like the AI kids that are walking around in our neighborhoods. But these kids, while they might seem like they're all about Xbox and everything else, they are uniquely identified with a lot of changes in the way that we think about you know, social activism and social responsibility from a corporate perspective and also on your own personal level. Yeah, I agree. And maybe it has to do with the way information travels, but I'm seeing the same thing where, you know, a lot of younger people are, well, more focused on social issues than you might imagine, you know, rather than playing uh, video games that they're, right, this is the stereotype. But there's an interesting link there, though, that, that I've seen because a lot of the tools we're using, you know, they're all on the computer. And there's this finesse that comes with being very comfortable in a digital environment and working on a three-dimensional model that really lives in the computer and understanding that almost as, as a real thing. So a lot of the younger talent that I work with, they're imagining the building as something that's really already built that it, it just exists in this digital medium. And that thing as an object, as something that, that's existing in a climate, is something that they're really comfortable manipulating and testing. So, you know, I think there's a funny link between kind of being very conversant in the digital realm and then what are the implications of that thing that you're making? Yeah. You know, and it's so funny because, and I'm just thinking about one game that my son plays, which is Minecraft. And when you think about the evolution of that game and just the work that goes into, you know, actually, because I've walked, I don't, I can't play it myself, but I've watched him play and the thought process and the thinking that goes into what he's designing and building. I mean, it's, I wasn't doing that when, I mean, I was playing with, you know, with Tinker Toys and stuff like that when I was a kid. And so, I mean, it's a much different environment with a, a level of spatial understanding that, you know, Quite frankly, kids our age, I mean, you know, we're probably fairly, you know, close in age that we didn't have that same understanding of spatial understanding, at least, if nothing else, where these kids nowadays, it's second nature to them. Yeah, a different kind of Legos. Yeah. A new 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 <laughs> set of Legos that he's getting. Yeah. And well, it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see where that goes, right? Are they better prepared earlier to take advantage of it, to take advantage of the data that's out there to be able to manipulate and use it? So yeah, I agree yeah. completely. So, and I'm going to try to get some information on this studio that took place in Houston, because I think other design professionals need to hear about this and be encouraged about ways that you being those that are listening to this in their local communities can find ways to give back to and share the resources that you have within your design firm with, you know, local schools and local organizations where young people are matriculating through those programs and they can get exposed to the type of work that AECOM is doing say with, for instance, the, the Port of Houston. And this was such an, a successful event with the city of Houston that not only did they declare a day named after the professor, he got a, a holiday that was inspired by that. But now you guys are planning to host a second studio with students in LA. 
And I would love for you just to talk about that and how that came about. Well, so this is just to carry on from that program. And Chris Reed is the professor leading this. But what is really exciting about the, the way the studio is being run is they're asking the students to look at a landscape, look at a place from the point of view of an animal as opposed to a human. And I think that that ties into something that I think is, is really exciting or an exciting new way to look at the world because, you know, we're humans and we design stuff. So we're imagining we're designing things for humans. You know, that table, that chair, that house, it's all for human use. But I think that part of what will shift kind of our relationship to the environment is stepping outside of it, not imagining that it's human-centered design, that it's kind of, it's nature-centered design. So part of the technique of the studio is to get the students to look at, you know, a, a piece of the landscape. This is this in Los Angeles, but look at it from the standpoint of the animals that use it as well as humans. And uh, LA is, tell us LA is challenging because it's, it's so crowded. There's almost no vacant land. So we found a few kind of marginal areas that are vacant that are, the students are working on. But the interaction between humans and animals is important. And this is a great way of looking at it, but it's also a great way of kind of shifting one's mindset to a nature focused rather than human focused. Yeah. I mean, I think that is, it, it's, it's perfectly, it's apt that we would want to think about things that are outside of our own frame of reference, right? Because I think a lot of times it's like, and this is not totally related, but it is because I think a lot of times like Brene Brown, she talks about when you try to understand another person, you have to kind of walk in their shoes a little bit and have a better understanding in the same vein to understand you know, how design and design sensibilities will impact all of society, you have to kind of walk in other people's shoes, or in this case, you know, take into consideration the animals and how they have to sustain it. And I was just having this conversation with some neighbors, and we were talking about how even in an area where I live in Northwest Arkansas, which is really starting to grow, and we're starting to experience infill and a higher level of placemaking, that the animals are starting to be displaced. And and you have to take that into consideration when you are practicing placemaking, no matter where you are, whether it's downtown L.A. or in, you know, the northwest Arkansas area of the Ozarks. So, yeah, and I, th I think that part of it has to do with the, the benefit of the animals. But another part has to do with the fact that if we do a better job for the planet, we're actually going to do a better job for humans or for ourselves. <laughs> yeah. So it's it, Bruce Mao talks about this and he says, well, we as humans using the planet as our pantry and as our toilet, <laughs> right. right? And so, right. you know, if, if there are resources out there, we're going to consume them for ourselves and we don't need them anymore or we create waste, then, you know, that waste just goes out there. So, you know, there's this idea that, well, if we're a little bit more conscious of the environment that we're living in, we're going to want to be less wasteful and we're going to want to consume fewer resources or consume resources in a more efficient way. So I think that mindset is incredibly important you know, going forward. It's just use, you know, do what you do and achieve what you can achieve, but try to use resources more efficiently, try to create less waste, more recycling and so on. And then, then we're going to have better outcomes for ourselves. But, but also, you know, if you're looking at it from standpoint of the natural environment or from the animals that live there, like you're saying, it's, you know, you're walking in their shoes and you're better able to understand, you know, good techniques for solving that. Yeah. And I also want people that are listening to this to also understand that this is driving a lot of the work that AECOM is currently doing and will do in the future as it will drive and impact the way a lot of other design firms operate and work. And the case in point with this is specifically, and you told me about this, is that you guys are working on the first carbon neutral arena in the US or period. Is this the first carbon neutral arena period? Uh, well, it's for certain in, in the U.S. I don't know if there are other ones that are planned outside of the U.S., but we're designing right now the new arena for the Los Angeles Clippers. It's called Intuit Dome. They already have their sponsor lined up. And it's going to be in Inglewood. It's right near SoFi Stadium. So this is under construction now. And it's, it was a really interesting project because, you know, climate or the, the sort of climate stress is quite well understood in L.A. So part of what we're doing is driven by codes. But part of it has to do with the ambition of the owner, where you know the owner really wanted a building that was going to make a statement and it was going to be a great neighbor 
for yeah. the city of Inglewood where it sits. Yeah. And the cool thing about this, which you, as you were describing it to me, is that it's going to do more than just serve as a athletic and sports arena. It will serve other needs that the local community has, which makes it part of that, you know, which, you know, that aspect of social and governance and environment kind of all married into one when you take those things into consideration. Yeah. And so, for instance, I mean, we have a big public plaza that sits outside the building and there's a large, you know, this jumbotron that sits out in the public plaza. So that way, even if you don't have a ticket, you can go and you can enjoy the excitement of the game and you can watch the game, you know, on this big screen. So the idea was that, you know, quite often these things are closed. You know, everybody comes in, they watch the game and there's no interaction with the community. We really wanted to open it up and definitely the ownership wanted to open it up to community. So it felt like this is part of the Englewood community. If you live nearby, you can go and you can watch the game on the Jumbotron and you get the buzz of the game, even if you're not, you know, right inside the venue. So I think that's really exciting. Also, there are community spaces that are woven into the program. So this is the, the whole goal is that this fits into the urban fabric of Inglewood. And it's not, you know, it's not this arena that's sitting in a parking lot that, you know, you, you show up at game time and you take off. So that was really important, you know, in terms of the mindset of, of our client, but also what we wanted to do for the city. Yeah. So I'm curious with all of this great work that you guys are doing, Ross, is how has this actually aided and abetted your efforts from a recruitment standpoint, both externally, right, outside of AECOM, as well as internally with people that might want to link up with some of the amazing work that you're doing? Well, you know, I, I, that is a great question. So part of what we're doing, is, you know, we're very large. So internally, we're working hard to communicate about our work you know, to the rest of the office. Because I've I'm working with teams in China, in the Middle East, in Europe. And through this sort of connecting the dots, we're sharing all of our work, you know, through the firm, but we're trying to do a better job of that. And so for instance, what we've done on a few projects is connect our teams. So I had a team in Los Angeles working on a tall building in China. And also had our Chinese office was working at simultaneously. So we were able to share a staff between those two offices to travel between the offices because you know our guys in LA had not had the experience of, of being in Shanghai or what was that like or didn't understand the site well so we were able to let them spend some time in Shanghai meet the team in person and also visit the site and so on and then we had you know young staff from our office in Shanghai come stay in LA for a period of time to work with the LA team so we're able to both cross pollinate ideas the team was working on but also give you know, our young staff a chance to see the way other people work, the way other cities work. So you know, we were able to take advantage of that, and we're trying to figure out other ways that we can do that with other offices and other projects. Because you know, I, th I think it's incredibly important that we go beyond you know, just having Teams calls and so on. There has to be some in-person interaction. Yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. And I'm actually kind of heartened to hear that because you know, we hear in the news all the challenges that specifically those two countries are facing, the U.S. and China. But, you know, I talk to people that are doing work with folks in mainland China and others. And so I'm always encouraged to hear that people are still bridging those gaps and, and there's still a lot of work that's being done. And I, I think that's there is a positive takeaway from there. Right. Because I, I think the world's a lot smaller than we realize. And we're all intricately connected and we're all impacted by each other as it is. And we just have to all learn how to play well in the sandbox. And certainly you guys are a perfect example of that in terms of the, the great work that you're doing at AECOM. Well, hopefully, I'm, well, I'm hopeful that the more interaction sort of allows us to, to kind of cool the temperature with China. Uh, we have a lot in common there and we're interconnected in so many ways that it's difficult when, uh, yeah, you know, when when the government sees it differently, but I, you know, I think in, in reality, on the ground, enormous amount in common with China and the way we interact in our offices, uh, we're linking across ge geographies with cities pretty much everywhere. So we're, you know, I don't know, I, I think that represents more the the reality of the future. Is yep. that you may be connected with someone who's sitting across the across the globe from you, and you may have a lot in common with them. Yeah. And even in that vein, just what you described is to me a tremendous recruiting tool 
for somebody coming out of school that wants that exposure and, you know, they want to work on a local project, but then have maybe a potentially an opportunity to work on something that's, that's a little bit larger. And that might be a ways away from where they currently are sitting and where their desk is. So I think that's really neat. And, and, and firms like AECOM offer that type of opportunity to design professionals. So I think yeah. that's exciting. Yeah, and I think, well, in, in a funny way, though, yeah, so I mean, just to add to that, the, the, <laughs> one thing that COVID did contribute, though, is this sort of uh, the fact that it's customary now to work through teams and so on and work digitally remotely. So that is actually making it a little bit easier to do what we we're just describing, all right, because I can connect someone who's working in, you know, in, in Charleston, North Carolina with somebody who's in, in Los Angeles. There are good ways to link up teams and talent that were a little bit more challenging in the past. So I think we can have, a, you know, looking forward, we're having pretty good success in doing that, just connecting up talent with opportunities in a way where, where nobody is, is required to, you know, pick up and move and just do that, do, you know, do that sort of periodically kind of link talent within different geographies. Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of put you on the spot, and I didn't tell you I was going to do this before, but in your heart of hearts, in the next, say, five to seven years, where do you hope this conversation around renewable energy and the discussions that you're starting today, where do you hope things are in five to seven years within the design industry space? Well, what I see is that this, this will just be commonplace. We won't be talking about it as if it's a new thing. This is just going to be a, w a way that everybody is working. And we're going to be on to the, on to the next challenge. We're going to be on to, to right, the, the next thing. But I, I do think that one of the things that has happened, and you can see it, for instance, in the way the AIA, which is the American Architects Association, which, which is really the kind of governing body for all architects in America, the way they are measuring projects for awards, it's very different than it used to be. So it used to be, you know, you, you built a building, you made it compelling as a, as a form, you know, as a, as a piece of sculpture or, uh, you know, compelling as, you know, as, in, as a building in a classical sense. Now you're required to provide information about, well, what is that building doing for the community it sits in? What is that building doing for the environment? So there are all these things that are external to the building itself that are part of the way projects are being measured right now. This is very new, and it's a new mindset, I think, for architects, including myself. But I do think that that's what's going to change. That's what's going to put us in a different place, say, five years from now having this conversation, where it's going to be commonplace to imagine everything outside of the building. What is it doing for the whole community? Also, the health and well-being of the people using the building, that seems like, well, yeah, that should be obvious. But I don't think there has been a lot of focus on health and well-being as opposed to just providing kind of leasable space that's of a standard. So I think that all of the stuff that's being measured right now is going to affect <laughs> this conversation in five years. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I, I, certainly I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that those two letters that everybody's talking about nowadays, which is AI and how AI informs the design industry and specifically a lot of the work that you're talking about right now will be quite interesting to see in the next five to seven years because it's moving at a lightning place pace and AI has really just gotten on the tip of everyone's tongue in the last four or five months. So we'll be interested to see what's happening down the road. Yeah. And I, and I, and I don't know. I, so, you know, I actually, I took the first digital course that was given uh, when, when I was in, in graduate school, mm -hmm. but worked through, you know, my, the early part of my career, we were, we were still drawing by hand, right? So now, no one even attempts to draw stuff by hand, <laughs> not in our normally, right? So we're, we've been watching this grow at pace where, you know, we could create three-dimensional models 30 years ago, but now those models are getting smarter. Those models, you can do a lot more with them, but the idea of having AI create the models it is something that's very new because, you know, we're, we're doing scripting to test out different forms. And, and we did a fair amount of that actually for our Clippers Arena that we used scripts and coding to test out different forms. So we're doing that now, but it's in a very controlled way. But the idea that you could <laughs> you give a text description to the computer and, and it could give you a solution it is definitely something that's new. And so, yeah, that, that might 
impact our conversation in five years. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I'm a huge architectural fan and, and I'm a big Frank Lloyd Wright fan. And I, I can only imagine being able to, in the near future, through natural language, tell a computer to draw up designs on you know a single level building home with the aesthetical sensibilities of a falling water. And, you know, I mean, and just be able to just tell it and it will understand what you're saying and it will spit out drawings that provide that for you. So, yeah. And, and, and at that, I'd say that, you know, the, the challenge to that, the challenge to that idea, and, and this is what we're seeing with machine learning is, well, the machine can only learn stuff that's already been done. And that, that's right. true for all architects, right? So I've got this library behind me and <laughs> I rely yeah. on it constantly because I want to be sure that I'm aware of everything that's been done, right? So you're not repeating things, but also so you can learn the lessons, you know, of what great architects, designers were, were doing in the past. It's a little different when, right, the computer's iterating just on things that are known because you, you don't know, are, is that just kind of repackaging Frank Lloyd Wright or right. are you taking the ideas of Frank Lloyd Wright and pushing them further? So. Yeah. I, uh, it'll be that'll be the interesting part, right? And in, yeah. in our conversation in five years is you know, where where does that land? Right, because never has a client ever said to you, I, "I want you to build something that has never been seen before." <laughs> oh no, no, they have. I know Actually, I'm being no. funny. That's the thing. It's like they always ask you for that. They want well, they want you to build something that that's never been seen before. So well, know. it's it's interesting though. I think I've had clients that are both ways, right? Where you show them something, is it has this been done before? Because I do a lot of work for conservative developers, and they're like, well, we want to take on something that's too new and too challenging, right? Because they want something that's tried and true. They're sure when they're going to build it, you know, the, the wall's not going to leak and so on. So yeah. they're, they're, there's a certain mindset that is, we want something that it may have a slightly different shape or different combination of materials, but it is solidly within what, what is normally built. And then, th then there are other clients who actually, I've had Chinese clients where we went through a series of schemes present them to to the client. They said, "No, go back to the drawing board. This this looks too familiar." Yeah, right? and and and, and, they're, and you're like, "Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> yeah, we thought this felt different, but you know, as clients, but just more knowledgeable about the work that's out there, right? Uh, and they want something new. You have to work very hard to come up with something that's different." And gives them a strong identity that's not to be confused with with some other building that already exists. Yeah, no, I mean you you've laid it out perfectly. I, I appreciate that. Well, Ross, this has been good. If if anybody listening to this podcast is like, man, I I really want to connect with him or connect with some of the work that AECOM is doing, what's the best way for people to do that? Well, it's through uh, through my LinkedIn is a great way to do it. Okay. AECOM Design on LinkedIn and our company website AECOM dot com. Yeah, and we'll make sure we put all of that in the show notes so that everything that we've referenced today, including the program that Ross was kind enough to share with us, we will put all of that in the show notes so that anybody listening to this can learn more about it and maybe even find out how they can participate in future endeavors like the program that took place in Houston, as well as the program that will happen in LA. And, you know, hopefully, I hope that we'll have more programs like this in every major city around the country because. You know, when design firm leaders like Ross and others are giving back to the local communities, we all benefit from that. So thank you so much for sharing a little bit about some of the things that you're doing there at AECOM, Ross. We really, really appreciate you coming on the podcast today. Well, thank you, Randy. Really, really fun to be on here. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, folks, there you have it. That's another episode of the Zweig Letter Podcast. To learn more about one of the oldest newsletters in the design industry, visit zweiggroup.com. You can read articles online, listen to this great podcast, sign up for a free new subscription to the newsletter, and have it delivered right into your email inbox every Monday morning. Sign up today. For more info about Zweig Group's advisory services or any Zweig Group publications, visit zweiggroup.com. You can subscribe to the Zweig Letter Podcast wherever you listen to it, and please consider rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I'm your host, Randy Wilburn. We'll see you back here soon for another new episode of the Zweig Letter Podcast. Peace. Thanks for tuning in to the Zweig Letter Podcast. We hope that you can be part of elevating the industry and that you can apply our advice and information to your daily professional life. For a free digital subscription to the Zweig Letter, please visit thezweigletter.com 
slash subscribe to gain more wisdom and inspiration in addition to information about leadership, finance, HR, and marketing your firm. Subscribe today.